it's a pleasure to be here. I think uh, this is my seventh time, I think, here. <laughs> it's always nice to be here. Uh, I think you already heard a lot about uh, subseasonal predictability and, and different ways of making subseasonal forecasts yesterday from Frederick and Roger Lewis, Adrian. And today, together with my colleague, Doison from Jamstick, we are going to introduce something about the seasonal forecast, uh, how we do seasonal forecast, the basis for the seasonal forecasts, and also design, some of the designs used for seasonal forecasts. I think each center has a different way of uh, doing forecasts, as we hear about that yesterday. ECMWF has a very complicated way of making initial license and then uh, do the forecasts both for sub-seasonal as well as seasonal. Uh, our center, we do it much simpler way. I think Doison is going to introduce that later. Uh, before that, I will tell you something, the basis on what we make the seasonal forecasts. <clears throat> I think this diagram already we saw several times. Uh, this shows different scales of processes from weather to climate change. And as we, as we know, the predictability of weather systems uh, is pretty high. Uh, the line here is showing you the predictability, <laughs> scale of predictability. And purposely, I have not put uh, the label here. It's a quite qualitative. You can think like if this is pretty high, the sub-seasonal is somewhere sitting here, and seasonal is coming closer to weather predictions, not at that stage yet. But we are doing quite well, and mainly because we are doing well, mainly because of some of the tropical climate phenomena, and most important of them is the Elino, and the next one is the Indian Ocean Dipole, and some other phenomena like here. Subtropical dipoles, uh, the Atlantic Nino, the Meridional Mode, NAO, AO, and Southern Annular Mode. Uh, as I said, the most dominant one is the Elino Southern Oscillation, and the predictability lies uh, in the ocean, um, as uh, shown by this uh, Bierkenis feedback method. Actually, his father started uh, all those equations, which is the basis for today's numerical weather prediction as well as climate predictions. Uh, he combined the Southern Oscillation, which was discovered by Gilbert Walker, trying to understand uh, the droughts in India. Uh, he found that the seesaw oscillation between uh, Tahiti and Darwin is linked to, to droughts and floods in India. Later, Bierkenis combined that with the already known fact that some years the Peruvian coast experienced warmer than normal condition. And then he linked that with the southern oscillation to say that this is uh, part of the same phenomena, coupled phenomena, uh, which uh, can transit between two stages, uh, between Elino and Lanina, through this normal condition. Normal condition and Lanina conditions are basically similar. Lanina is kind of uh, uh, stronger manifestation of the normal condition. When you have strong easterlies, and that can cause upwelling and cooling of the eastern tropical Pacific. The, the Elino is just the opposite of that, and that happens because either Easterlies become weak or we have strong Westerlies from the west, and that causes uh, uh, downwelling Kelvin waves, warm Kelvin waves, which are coupled to those winds, propagate eastward and cause the Elino. The transition between these two phases are not clearly explained by Bierkenis feedback process. Bierkenis feedback process only says, once you have a system like this, uh, this can continue for, for some time. And that gives us the predictability. Once we have some system like that, we know that after six months, we'll get the Elino. And if we can observe that and put, it, put that into the model, we can clearly say when that transition phase will happen and when that will end, in, end into Elino. But the problem is then how it go back to Lanina, and that's where the, the dynamical model comes to the picture, and, and those can give us predict predictability for transition between Elino and Lanina. Why you want to learn Elino and Lanina? Because of the large influence we have from these tropical phenomenon, 
like one is the ENSO influence. You can see that ENSO influence is most part of Eastern Pacific and also Western Pacific, maritime continent, India, even Africa. And also we have teleconnection to North, North America as well as South America. And because of that, many people try to understand El Nino and try to improve the predictability of El Nino. Besides El Nino, we have also several uh, basin scale phenomena. One of them is the Indian Ocean Dipole. Uh, Indian Ocean Dipole is kind of mirror image of El Nino, in which we have uh, like warm anomaly happen on the western side of the basin. Uh, usually, eastern side is warm. But some years, the winds become weak, the, and we have strong southeasterlies, and that can help upwelling on the eastern side. And then downwelling Kelvin wave propagate westward, and then we have warming on the western side to, call, to create this kind of dipole-like structure in the, in the SST anomalies coupled to the atmosphere. Again, because of those downwelling Kelvin waves and, and upwelling in the eastern Eastern Indian Ocean near Sumatra, uh, we can expect some kind of predictability. Because once we have a downwelling Kelvin wave, we know that it takes some time to reach Somali coast, and that gives us the predictability. And that's how the model get, gets the predictability. Again, it has uh, its influence. Uh, the, the western side is warm, so that's why Kenya and, e and East Africa gets a lot of rain during positive Indian Ocean dipole years. The maritime continent, uh, like Elino, becomes dry and cool during positive Indian Ocean dipole years. Opposite thing happens when you have a negative Indian Ocean dipole. Of course, also like uh, Elino, the Indian Ocean dipole also has teleconnections going to the East Asia, uh, Australia, and South America, <coughs> even Europe. Uh, good question. <laughs> Uh, usually, the Elino, as you know, takes almost a year to transit from Western Pacific to Eastern Pacific and then coming back. The IOD is not so long. It takes about three to six months. Uh, yes. Usually, seasonal. yes, very much seasonal. And very much locked to monsoon season, actually. It starts somewhere between May and June when you have transition to, to summer, Indian summer monsoon. And then um, it continues through the summer monsoon and through the fall. And then towards uh, November, December, when the transition goes to the maritime continent monsoon, uh, the IOD gets terminated. Mostly coupled to the maritime continent winds. The southeasterlies are very important here. Like to maintain this uh, upwelling near Sumatra, we need these strong southeasterly trades. And that can continue until we have the winter monsoon. Once winter monsoon sets in, the northerly comes in. So that's why South East Italy dies and the phenomena terminates. There's a high uh, impact, high temperature, I think, the monsoon. Monsoon and this, yes, 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 it is. And then later we identified, this is our boss uh, from Jamstek. So together with him, we worked and identified this new, not so new, but we call it Elino Modoki. Modoki is a Japanese word, which means something which look like, but not quite like the Elino. So it's a kind of fake Elino, in other words. Uh, it looks like Elino. If you are on the western side, like if you're in Japan and maritime continent, this is kind of Elino. The east side is warm, the west side is cold. But if you are on the South American coast, this is not El Nino. Because during El Nino years, South American coast will become very warm. And you expect a lot of fish mortality and many other problems. Of course, we get a lot of rain. Uh, but during El Nino Modoki years, when Central Pacific is warm, Eastern Pacific is not warm. It's like La Nina condition. So that's why for 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 people in South America and even North America, it's like La Nina. But people in maritime continent and East Asia, maybe it's like El Nino. That's why we call it as El Nino Modaki. Uh, what happens is like uh, on western side, we have westerlies, 
which kicks in the Kelvin waves, warm Kelvin waves, but they do not propagate all the way to the eastern Pacific because on the eastern side, the Easterlies are still strong. So, they do not allow the warm Kelvin wave to go all the way to the eastern side. So, that is why we have warming in the central Pacific. It is kind of a linear, but does not go all the way to the eastern Pacific. And this also has its uh, own life cycle like 3 to 6 months, not 1 year like Elino. And uh, its influence is different uh, compared to Elino. The opposite phase is Lanina Modoki. And what is the meaning of those curves in the, the upper flashes and the downward flashes? This one? No, at the ocean. Ah, okay. So this means we still have downwelling on both sides, upwelling in the central Pacific. And this means upwelling on eastern side, western side, but downwelling in the central Pacific. The thermocline gets depressed in the central Pacific, not so much on the eastern side or western side. It is more like Lanina condition, but central Pacific is warm. And we are interested to know about Elina Modoki and its uh, predict predictability because the influence is quite different, particularly on, on, on the west coast of the US. You can see here, this is the climatological rainfall for Japan, China, and US. Uh, this one is, uh, these three plots are related to Elino Modoki, and the bottom three plots are related to Elino. You can see that during Elino Modoki years, uh, the west coast become very dry, simply because it is like Lanina eastern side is still cold. So, they do not get so much of rain, whereas during Elino year, because the eastern side is quite warm, they get a lot of rain, like Peruvian coast. So, that is why it is very important to know whether it is Elino or Elino Modoki for those regions. And also, southern Japan is very dry during Elino Modoki years, not so dry during Elino years. And Angji River Valley here gets a lot of rain during Elino Modoki years, not so much during Elino year. Besides those basin scale phenomena, we also have some regional scale phenomenon uh, like uh, the Bengal Anino for southern Africa. Many people know what is Bengal Anino. Similarly, recent, recently we found a coastal phenomenon which we call the Ningalu Nino. Ningalu is a Ningalu reef here of west coast of Australia. And in some years, uh, we, we, we observe a lot of uh, coral bleaching and fish mortality. And those are the year when you have warm anomalies here. And those we call as Ningalu Nino years. Opposite thing happens. You also have Ningalu Nina when you have strong cooling and good fish productions in, in west coast of Australia. And that kind of regional phenomenon also uh, very important for regional rainfall variability as well as fisheries and, and other societal activities. So that's why, uh, as you can see, through all those climate phenomena, it's very important to understand the air-sea interaction, ocean-atmosphere interaction. And that is the basis for the predictability of seasonal climate forecasts. If you don't have uh, dynamics, ocean wave dynamics, coupled to the atmosphere, we don't get the potential predictability source uh, from, from the observations to get into the model and predict them uh, on seasonal time scales. Uh, this is what uh, was done in early 80s to try to predict Elino. Now, Elino is a kind of linear phenomenon in, in tropical Pacific uh, where the uh, heat content in the upper ocean is uh, coupled to the atmospheric wind. And that coupled process move from west to east to give you a lino and then return back to give you lanina. Uh, for example, if you, for, for some reason you have westerlies, strong westerly brost in, in western Pacific, that can cause uh, like the, the downwelling Kelvin wave to propagate from west to east. At the same time, because of the wind stress call, we get uh, negative anomalies on both sides of the equator. The warm anomalies, Kelvin wave anomalies go eastward. At the same time, 
cold anomalies move westward and these cold anomalies after some time gets reflected on the western boundaries and come back to, to, to eastern coast uh, to initiate the La Nina condition. That is the potential source of predictability in the Elino phenomena. And that was exploited in 80s by simple coupled model and one of the well-known coupled model is Ken Jebiak model, uh, where one layer of the atmosphere was coupled to two layer of the ocean. And it was very good in providing predictions on several seasons ahead to two years ahead, which was then replaced by GCMs. Uh, GCMs are more complex. We have the ocean model, which has all its components. And uh, the ocean models are run usually spin up from initial state of rest. And then, um, and then we have the data assimilation. Uh, some of the models don't have data assimilation, like the syntax frontier model, which will be presented by those and later, is not, uh, doesn't have a data, data assimilation, it only takes SST nudging. And some models also do the atmospheric initialization for even seasonal forecasts. But we don't do that in syntax frontier model. It's not so essential for seasonal climate forecasts to initialize the atmosphere model because once you provide the SST or the, the subsurface conditions to the ocean, the ocean will feed back to the atmosphere and then atmosphere will adjust to that SST uh, to, to, to provide the seasonal climate predictions. But some models are also, some centers are also doing atmospheric initializations. And once we initialize both, then we couple them and ocean model runs and then exchange the flux, fluxes with the atmosphere and atmosphere returns back wind stress and heat flux, heat fluxes. And in that sense, uh, we provide the forecasts. There are several WMO centers which are giving now um, the, the forecasts. These are the designated WMO centers, uh, Environment Canada. We have, I think, several representatives here from some of the centers. Environment Canada and then the KMA from Seoul, Beijing, ECMWF, and the Moscow, Washington. CPTEC is the Brazilian center. Then the Pretoria South African Weather Service, uh, Poama, Melbourne, Bureau of Meteorology, and JMA from Tokyo and Meteo France uh, Toulouse. So all these centers are designated center for providing um, climate forecasts, global producing centers for providing seasonal climate forecasts. But to, to get that information, we must be one of the member of this. Either it should be member of one of those GPCs or uh, the regional centers or RCOPs or NMHS. Uh, at the moment, uh, the data is restricted to, to, to those users. Uh, these are some of the samples uh, from those prediction centers. This is a 2014 El Nino predictions by ECMWF and the Met Office. You can see some differences in the predictions, but usually the predictions are close to, uh, to each other. 2015 El Nino um, predictions, when it was predicted, uh, as you can, as you might be knowing, 2015 was followed by 2014 Elino, which is very rare. Uh, two consecutive Elinos are very rare. And most models were not getting the 2015 Elino until February, February of this year. So the triggering also is an important factor in, in the models. And it's important to, to observe when the model captures the signal. Most model gets uh, around February, March the following years, uh, the coming Elino of that year. Now, if you are not able to get the forecasts from those global producing centers, you need not worry because there are several other centers like IRI, EPEC Climate Center, even in JAMSTEC, we provide the forecast uh, online for users. Uh, like uh, here you are comparing the 2015-16 ENSO outlooks uh, from uh, from IRI plumes, there are several models available, model <coughs> predictions available from the IRI site. APCC also has several models. Jumpstick, you have only one model, and then we can compare that 
uh, with PCMWF model. Uh, for the 2015-16 ENSO outlooks, we, we expect this ENSO will terminate around January, February this year and then return back to a La Nina stage uh, somewhere uh, towards the December uh, 2016 to January 2017. Okay, a little bit about our prediction system, the Syntex Frontier model. Uh, you can see here the, the Syntex Frontier model actually originate, originated from it, Italy. Uh, there is a center INGV not far away from here in Bologna. And they started this model and then we, we borrowed that model and uh, tried to improve it using the R simulator. At that time this was the R simulator, uh, number one computer in 2002, but now I think in top 500. Uh, and the, the, the atmosphere model is T106 with 19 level. The, the ocean model equatorial enhanced to half a degree, but usually it's around two degrees away from the equator and both models are coupled every two hours. We have a second version now. Doisan is going to present a little bit about that. Yes, uh, we have more number of labels now and uh, uniform half degree global. Before we go to the prediction, the first thing we do, we try to understand if the model is actually capturing the Elino, the dipole and some of the tropical phenomena, besides of course the extra tropical phenomena. Uh, as you can see here, the model was able to simulate the Elino, the dipole together. Uh, this is one of the model years, not necessarily related to any of the actual calendar years. But nevertheless, it was simulating the IOD and the dipole very well, so we had some confidence. But not all the dipoles are related to Elinos, so that's why we wanted to see if the model is able to capture the Indian Ocean dipoles together with La Nina. So, so this is one of the years when the model is capturing one of the Indian Ocean dipole phenomenon together with La Nina. So, so we had some confidence that this model has uh, basics uh, uh, to capture the Elino, La Nina and dipoles uh, uh, on different phases. Then before we go into the predictions, we, we try to do the verifications which is one of the very important process in seasonal climate forecasts. I think uh, and Andy Robertson is going to talk about that later next week. Uh, so this is the seasonal, uh, this is the uh, simple skill score of the Jamstack Syntex Frontier model. Uh, at three months lead, you can see that the model surface temperature, sea surface temperature, predictability is quite high. The correlation is 0 0.9 between model predictions and the observations. At six month lead, we still retain very high predictability in the tropical Pacific, but started losing predictability in the Indian Ocean. At nine month lead, we have still good predictability in the tropical Pacific, so ENSO predictability remains even at nine months lead time but we are losing the predictability in the Indian Ocean. At 12 months lead, we have almost no predictability in the Indian Ocean. We have quite high predictability in the tropical Pacific, which means the model is pretty good to predict Elino uh, one year ahead. Uh, now the new model is able to predict even two years ahead. However, the predictability is not so high in the Indian Ocean, mainly because the Indian Ocean is uh, uh, having several scales of phenomena and their interaction is not so easily captured by the model. So that's why at longer lead time, the predictability in the Indian Ocean is not so high. So as you heard from Adrian and, other, and Frederick yesterday, we can improve the predictability. Yes. Uh, this is just uh, ah, same multi model ensemble, okay. So I think he is going to talk about that. Uh, what we did in this, like we, we had three different coupling physics. The same model, but we employ three different coupling physics. So in, 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 in essence, they are quite different because the coupling is different. So that's why we call it semi-multi-model ensemble. Although the model is same, we have different coupling physics uh, for different ensemble members. I think he is going to talk more about that. 
Okay, so we, we also participated in multimodal ensembles uh, to, to, to see that, to see if we have any improvements in predictability skills uh, by combining our predictions with several other predictions. And this was done by Bin Wang in IPRC uh, using the APCC, Epic Climate Center models. They had, I think, eight uh, models. And from that, again, we find that uh, this, they separated the June, July, August predictability from December, January, February predictability. And you can see that the predictability is quite high. Uh, I think this is a three months lead, quite high uh, for both December, January, February, and June, July, August. They had a marginal improvements uh, at 12 months lead, uh, but basically the, the syntax uh, predictability remained quite high among all the model members. This is another example where we try to understand the predictability again, the skills of the predictability. Uh, the black line here is persistent line, so we think that this month's SST is same next month and the following months. And these are the lead months, one to six months ahead, and these are the anomaly correlations. So you can see that the, the syntax predictability remain quite high, above 0 0.9, uh, even at six months lead time, much above the persistence level here. And most of the other models were doing quite well as well. So, so most of the models are doing quite well to predict Elino six months ahead. Uh, and we find that if we can add the trends in the global warming, the global warming trend itself gives some predictability. The problem is to capture that trend quite, um, the problem is to capture that trend in the model is not so easy. So if you just take the observed trend and add to that, add that to the climate predictions, we find there is some improvement, almost 0.2 correlation improved at one month's lead time. Compared to Elino predictability, the dipole predictability is not so high. Uh, we also have two barriers. For Elino, we have only one barrier, spring barrier. But for dipole, we have both spring barrier as well as winter barrier. So that's why the predictability of dipole doesn't go very well beyond six months lead time. And once we have those predictability, we try to apply some of those, as Adrian was mentioning about this. We had a project in South Africa. Uh, Babatunde is here, I think. So he was part of that project. Uh, for the first two, three years, we try to understand um, the, the climate variability in Southern Africa and then the predict predictability skills of syntax model and also the models available in South Africa. And in this phase, starting in 2014, last year, it will continue until 19. What we are trying to do is using those climate predictions, we, we are trying to develop an early warning system for infectious diseases like malaria, diarrhea, and pneumonia. Several centers are involved from both sides. And most importantly, we are going to use uh, the vectory model, uh, which Adrian has developed. And this is some of the, these are some of the preliminary results, uh, as you can see here. The bottom figure here is showing you the malaria prevalences um, in Africa, in southern South Africa. Uh, as you can see here, the, the Limpopo province and the coastal belt, belt gets a lot of malaria incidences. Uh, mostly those are important from Mozambique. And the model was doing quite well, actually, to, to capture that. And we are very confident that the, this model can be used um, together with the climate model predictions to provide the early warning system. Okay, so, so we understand that models are doing well, but models also have biases, and models also are uh, missing some of the, the, the uh, transition phases of El Nino and other climate phenomena. And to improve that, we have to improve model resolutions, we have to improve model physics. In fact, some of the models are, models are now trying to dissolve clouds so that we don't have to have cloud physics in the model. Uh, going into three to five kilometer resolution so we can, we can uh, get rid of cloud physics. Besides all those things, 
at the WCRP working group for seasonality into annual predictions, we have taken up some of the projects to, to improve the model predictions and to reduce the model biases. The, the first project led by Bill Merrifield from Environment Canada and also Mikhail Tolsky from Russian Atmospheric Sciences. So in that project, uh, what we are trying to do is like, uh, we know that most models are actually having problem uh, for longer term predictions. When you go from multi-year to decadal predictions, most models have problem to, to, to have the drift from, from observed climate to model climate. And to avoid that drift, uh, they are trying to initialize the model at every one year or two years so that the model stays around the observed climate logic. In addition to that, for sub-seasonal predictions, we know that uh, the models suck when we initialize the atmosphere and ocean model. We have a lot of suck in the initial state. And Mikhail is trying to improve that uh, initial suck uh, by, by improving the initialization schemes. And we hope that through that we can reduce some of the biases and socks so that uh, we can improve predictability both for sub-seasonal as well as decadal scale predictions. The second project we are taking now is the snow cover, how to initialize snow in the models. Uh, in last three, four years, we had a project called GLESS, Global Land Atmosphere Couple Experiments. Uh, in that, the soil initialization was very important and many, many centers participated in that to improve soil moisture initialization. And that was quite successful. Now, now what we are trying to do is uh, to initialize snow, both uh, land snow as well as the sea ice and polar snow in the models. And it is led by uh, Jong from Seoul and Ivan from Norway. Then, of course, we have the problem in teleconnection. Although we are getting the Elino dipole and other climate, tropical climate phenomena very well, the teleconnection from that, those climate to extra tropics are not well captured by the models. So we have the third project to, to understand that, the, the projection of tropical climate to extra tropics and the, the atmospheric gross wave propagating around the globe, taking those signal from one region to another region to understand those variability in the model and the biases in the model, uh, this project is going to work on that. Besides those three projects, as Adrian was mentioning yesterday, we also have the database climate system historical forecast project. Uh, in this, we are going to archive all the hindcast results. At, at the moment, we have already several models, one, two, three, four, five, about 15 models here. And all these model results will be archived, not only for, from, for the present state, but also all the future states. So we have uh, one of the archives where you can understand why one model went from bad state to a good state, what kind of model physics they change over the time, so that we can, we can replicate those things in other models. That's one of the ideas where, why we are archiving all the data uh, at the moment, most of the monthly data are available and they are, now they are trying to archive the daily data. So this will be a good point if you want to understand or try to, to, to work with the seasonal forecasts. Um, before going to forecasts, you can try to understand the, the, the model physics uh, using those models. I will stop there and maybe Doison will take over from here. Any questions to me? You can ask afterwards also. Use this one. Okay. Just a
Ah, uh, it's working. Okay, good. Okay, I will talk about the syntax F seasonal prediction system. So, uh, first three slides, I'd like to run over the basic information about the seasonal prediction. So, you know, that there's a difference between seasonal prediction and weather prediction. So, seasonal prediction is a kind of climate prediction. So, its a target is uh, to predict the climate. So, climate is a statistic of weather. For example, the monthly average as a number of rainy day in a month and as a number of typhoon in seasons. So, so weather prediction is try to predict the weather itself a few days later. And so this is an interest on time scale. This is important for S2S project. But uh, my talk is a uh, target is a uh, seasonal. So target is a month three average or three months average. And lead time is a uh, three to sometimes up to nine months lead time. So uh, as uh, uh, Behera-san already explained, the potential source of seasonal predictability is mainly due to answer predictions. So because uh, contribu uh, for success of seasonal predictions, the contribution from ocean is important because ocean variability is very slow relative to atmosphere, and the ocean has a large heat content relative to atmosphere. Those uh, character of oceans can work as a seasonal, uh, potential source of seasonal predictability. In particular, tropical ocean is crucial because uh, tropical ocean is very warm and it can drive the global atmospheric circulation. So here I would like to introduce the two pioneering work by Bihakness, uh, Dr. Bihakness. Uh, so he found the air sea couple phenomena in the tropical Pacific. And also uh, in 1964, and three uh, years later, he found the teleconnection from tropics to mid latitude. This is a, a fundamental theory of the seasonal predictions. So, so we need to the numerical, uh, numerical seasonal prediction system should be based on ocean atmosphere couple model. So the numerical weather prediction mostly employs a standalone atmospheric model because on the assumption that the oceans do not change uh, in the relatively short prediction period, of, for example, one week. However, for prediction of ENSO and its induced seasonal anomaly, uh, we need the application on ocean atmosphere couple model. So this is a schematic diagram for the numerical signal prediction system. As a first step, we know the current, we have to know the current state of the climate. In particular, uh, ocean state is important for seasonal prediction. So we need to the uh, observational system for, for example, mooring buoy or satellite uh, observation. And those uh, information should be assimilated in the model. Uh, this is, uh, in other words, it is called the initialization. And also, uh, we will conduct the numerical integration by a couple GCM using the supercomputer. So by the way, this is uh, our new supercomputer called the Ash simulator. So we have uh, uh, basically three steps for the numerical seasonal prediction. So the question is, which step is the most a critical or prediction scale. Actually, this figure is, uh, shows the relative reduction in SST error, uh, SST forecast error over the Nino 3. Actually, uh, Nino 3 is the El Nino index and by the ECMWF seasonal prediction system. So ECMWF successfully improved the seasonal prediction scale, uh, prediction scale for El Nino. And actually, the total gain is shows uh, by yellow crumb, so about 35% relative to the probably 1996 operational uh, original one. And this red crumb is a contribution from the ocean initialization. And this blue crumb shows the contribution from model development. So this figure shows the model development and ocean initialization are equally important for improving the seasonal prediction skill. So I would like to uh, focus on our seasonal prediction system, Syntax F. So behera already showed uh, this slide. So uh, uh, this model is uh, developed at JAMA and as a EU-Japan collaboration. So here I would like to 
uh, introduce how we developing the, this model and uh, its initialization scheme. So first about the model development. So actually the, in classical method, uh, a mo modeler try to tune to the individual uncoupled GCM separately. So tune the atmospheric model and tune the ocean model and try to couple between us, uh, between two. But in contrast to the classical method, our model development, uh, we tune the, it directly by improving the ARC couple physics. So we focus the uh, potential impact of the strong ocean current on wind stress. Actually, this is important to simulation of the climatology and enthalpy variability. So this figure shows the linearly regressed SST and surface wind anomalies map on the Nino 3 SST index. And this figure is from observation, so we can find to the El Nino structure, right? But, and this is a control run by the syntax F, but this is a, the effect of surface, ocean surface current on wind stress uh, totally neglected in the control run. And uh, this FCPL run, uh, in this run, the surface wind stress is calculated by like this. So this is a, a density of air, and the CD is a drug coefficient, and VR is a surface wind speed, and we always uh, uh, surface ocean current. So this scheme is considering the impact of the ocean surface current on wind stress. So you know this model and focusing on the warm water pool regions. Uh, this is actually the warmest ocean in the world, and uh, it's very important for fair connections. So if focusing this area, uh, FCPL run is much similar to the real ocean, right? So this is one example of our model development. And also, for about the initializations, so we use the SST matching scheme. And this scheme is a, OG, uh, Syntax F model is a couple model. And the OGCM SST is strongly matched towards a observed SST in a couple mode. So in a couple mode, the AGCM forced by OG, uh, such generated OGCM SST and then the OGCM forced by the AGCM simulated flux, but uh, with matching to observe the SST. This is the SST matching scheme, and this is uh, one of the simplest approach for the initialization, but it can provide a compatible initial condition between the atmosphere and ocean. This compatible initial condition is very important because of this the balance between the ocean and the atmosphere can reduce the initial shock during forecast. And also these simple uh, schemes can capture the aristic subsurface ocean structure in the tropical Pacific. Uh, this figure shows the Hochmera diagram, you know, the time evolutions and longitude, and, uh, you know, the, shows the uh, the 20 degree isotherm depth anomaly along the equatorial Pacific. And uh, left column is from the soda. A uh, soda is uh, ocean simulation data, is uh, including the all subsurface information. But the uh, left column is the uh, SST matching run with syntax F. So you know that we are just using the SST information. So, you know, this is very similar between two. So we can say to the SST nudging, uh, our SST nudging run can successfully capture the subsurface structure in the tropical Pacific. Actually, this success depends on the performance of the AGCM and the OGCM. And uh, also, uh, how do we generate ensemble member in our system? So yesterday, uh, Tompkinson already explained the uh, necessary of the uh, ensemble member because the uh, atmosphere ocean couple system involves a strong nonlinearity. So variation in initial condition and physical schemes lead to diverse solution. So need ensemble prediction to reduce the prediction uncertainty. So we generate the ensemble member associated with uh, different initial condition and different physical schemes. So I have uh, three strengths of SST nudging for initialization, and 
we have a three coupling physics scheme for considering the effect of the ocean surface current on wind stress. So three times three times, we have a totally nine ensemble members uh, employed for seasonal prediction and uh, initiated every month in, from 1982 to present. Okay, this is a summary of the, our system and uh, this shows the schematic figure. If we start with the prediction from May 1st, 2050, so we have a continuous SST notching run with a syntax F. And uh, if we start with the uh, prediction from May 1st, uh, we can use uh, this restart file from the SST notching run and we can run the free run. Actually, this is a forecast run and uh, running to the, up to the target season. Okay, so how skillful is our system for El Nino prediction? So this is a time series of Nino 3.4. Nino 3.4 is an index of El Nino. It defines uh, the sea surface temperature anomaly uh, averaged in this region. And uh, this uh, black line shows the time series of Nino 3.4. And uh, generally speaking, uh, when the Nino 3.4 beyond the 0.5 degree, we can say the El Nino is occurring. So uh, we have a several El Nino event, but uh, this event uh, is the strongest event in El Nino in 1997 and 1998. Actually, WMO uh, estimates the 34 billion US dollar loss in the world due to this the strongest El Nino. So, and so prediction is very important, from, not from scientific viewpoint, but also the economical and societal viewpoint. So first I'll try to focus on this event and show the prediction scale. And this is just focusing on the near 3.4 in 1997 to 1999, uh, 1998. So black is observations. And this blue, nine, uh, blue uh, line shows uh, our prediction from the 1997 April first initialization. So here, right? And this red line is the ensemble mean. So when the model initialized at the, at the point, at the point, so, you know, the tropical Pacific was an almost neutral state. Uh, when the prediction started at that point, our model successfully predict our El Nino occurrence. Actually, the uh, all nine member is beyond the 0.5 degree, so we can say the our model successfully predict El Nino occurrence from the neutral states. Uh, however, unfortunately, the amplitude yes, was underestimated. This one? Oh, yeah. It's a prediction that is April 1st, and uh, prediction uh, end by March, so it's about 12 months predictions. Okay, and, uh, and the next, so when the model, uh, sorry, initialized the, oh, okay, sorry, as a, at that point, actually at that point, we, uh, El, uh, tropical Pacific was uh, already El Nino-like state, but uh, actually this is a moderate El Nino state. When the model initialized at that point, you know, our nine ensemble member predict that those uh, El Nino-like condition would uh, enhanced in the coming uh, six months. So actually, I already said the 1997 event was the strongest event. So Nino 3.4 beyond the, about the two degree. So now is uh, some research are called this extremely strong El Nino as a super El Nino. So I can say that our model successful predicted the occurrence of the extreme strong El Nino uh, from a moderate El Nino state. Okay, uh, this is for the 1997 and the 1998 event. So next question is how skillful is uh, our model for other ENSO event? To answer this question, I'd like to explain the uh, first is about the three months read predictions line, uh, the next figure. So this is also Nino 3.4 uh, index, and uh, this uh, green line is the ensemble mean prediction 
from the 1997 April 1st initialization, right? And uh, so April, March, uh, April, May, uh, June, and just a three months read prediction, I plotted this red cycle. And also this purple line, the prediction from the May 1st, 1997. So May, June, July, I plotted the uh, pr three months predictions here. And also blue, blue, blue color shows the June 1st initialization. So I also plotted the three months read prediction. And this connected this line. And this red line is called the three months read prediction. And uh, same as uh, this uh, six months read prediction is shown by blue line. So this is a P of the Nino three, uh, time series of Nino 3.4, uh, black is observation, and red is our three months read prediction, and blue is a six months read prediction. So at the first grant, so it looks similar, right? Uh, our model is very skillful for, to predict El Nino. Actually, correlation between observation and three months read prediction is uh, close to the uh, point 0.9. And also, uh, observation, uh, correlation between observation and the blue uh, six months this time also beyond the point uh, 0.85. No, it's very high. However, not good for the timing of initiation. For example, here is, uh, we have uh, some failure for initi initiation of El Nino, right? And also we have a failure of decay, a termination phase of El Nino. So our system have a problem to predict the timing of initiation and termination. Okay, anyway, our system is very skillful uh, for answer prediction relative to other model. So this figure is also already Behrasan showed, so, uh, but I will explain the detail. So this is a correlation between observation and prediction. So one is a perfect, and uh, 0.5 is a relatively low scale. And x-axis shows the forecast read months from one month to six months. And this line is a SSD persistence line. So this shows the lag out correlations. And uh, this is uh, each model's prediction system. And actually, this is just for the Nino 3.4 index in 1982, 2004. So red line is our model. So our model is, uh, uh, shows a very good scale relative to the other model. And question is, uh, this is up to six months. How about predictions beyond six months read time? So actually our system is a scale for, for the two year answer prediction. This figure also uh, similar to previous one, but uh, up to 24 months read time. So this is also SSD persistence, and this is a nine ensemble members prediction by Syntex F. So up to 24 months, still it's close to the correlation close between the observation and the prediction close to 0.6. So this is a scale from a statistical uh, analysis significance. Okay. So each one of those, you know, spectrum is a member, isn't it? This is an ensemble member. The ensemble member. Yeah, each member. Yeah, each member is below to the mean. Okay, so this is uh, each ensemble member's prediction, and this black line is uh, ab averaged in the nine ensemble and calculated the correlation. So sometimes there's a uh, ensemble means can reduce the uncertainty of predictions. Okay, so by the way, how about this year's answer predictions? This is also Nino 3.4, and blue is our uh, observation of the this year, so now is a strong El Nino is occurring. Uh, actually, this year's El Nino is almost similar to the strongest El Nino in 1997 and uh, 1998. And uh, actually, this red line is a prediction from the May 1st initialization this year. So our model nicely predicted the super El Nino occur in this winter from the May 1st, and now is a we, we, we are here, so a, we have a strong El Nino now. And also what will happen next two years, so I, uh, we predicted that this strong El Nino uh, may turn to La Nina in next year. So this year may be similar to the strongest El Nino in 1997 and 1998, 
at that time also strong El Nino is quickly tra phase transition and to turn to the La Nina. Uh, I, uh, sorry, model predict the probably this year's El Nino also phase transition to La Nina in next year. And also this is an example for our prediction about the coming winter, coming December, January, February average uh, by our model. And this is a sea surface temperature anomaly. And uh, we can find to the very strong El Nino will, will, persi will persist in the coming winter. And this is a surface air temperature anomaly. And most of the world uh, will experience a warmer than normal condition in the coming winter. And uh, this is the rainfall predictions. And uh, green color shows the wetter than normal. And uh, gray, uh, sorry, the brown color shows the drier than normal. So probably the uh, uh, Western Euro, uh, sorry, Western US will be drier than normal, but uh, for Brazil, is uh, will be drier than normal due to the mainly due to the El Nino. Okay, so this is uh, my summary. So syntax F1 is uh, now is a uh, very skillful to predict El Nino. However, I show the uh, there is a room of improvement for the timing of initiation and termination prediction. So how should we improve the, our system? So I already explained the model development and ocean initialization are equally important for that. So strategy one, I'm now the developing the model. The previous one, version is the syntax F1, and I'm now preparing the second version, so updating the model, uh, updating version of the model and enhance the vertical resolution in atmosphere model and enhance the horizontal resolution in ocean model and include the sea ice model. So I'm now writing a paper about that. And, uh, but I want to show the preliminary result uh, about the syntax F2. So this is uh, also a prediction scale, uh, actually based on the correlation uh, for the December, January, February averaged between observation and prediction from November first initialization. So in the prediction from November first initialization and target is a December, January, February. So it's a, about lead months is a, about a two or three months lead time. And the uh, left column shows the uh, prediction scale for two meter air temperature anomaly. And the uh, right column for the prediction scale for rainfall anomaly. And the upper panel for the syntax F1 and lower panel the syntax F2. So we can find to the some improvement uh, in the southern hemisphere by syntax F2, and also some improvement of the rainfall prediction in syntax F2. Okay, so about, and also strategy two about the ocean initialization. I said the success of the SST matching initialization scheme is that over a region where ocean variability is strongly constrained by the couple air interaction. So actually, this figure is from the Arun Kumar's papers in 2013 and shows the local simultaneous SST and rainfall anomaly correlations, a point by point correlation. Right? And it, uh, so correlations for uh, each season. And uh, for example, uh, if the correlation between the SST and rainfall anomaly is uh, highly positive, that means a uh, warm SST is correlated with uh, more rainfall. So that means a uh, warm SST drives a convection as a more rainfall. That situation is a uh, ocean drives the atmosphere. And uh, this is good for SST energy. So for example, in tropical Pacific, we can, high, we can show the high positive correlation between SST and rainfall. So that means that tropical Pacific air sea coupling is strong. However, for Indian Ocean, we can find the negative correlation, right? So negative correlation means uh, cold SST uh, is correlated with uh, more rainfall. Because the uh, more rainfall is uh, less sunshine, it cools uh, sea surface temperature. So that means the atmosphere drives the ocean temperature. So in that case, is a atmosphere is driver. So and the air sea couple, air sea couple feedback is weak. So 
SSD nudging is good for the capturing the subsurface structure in tropical Pacific, but not enough for the tropical Indian Ocean and also tropical Atlantic. This is a one problem of SSD nudging system. And the another one, that this scheme cannot resolve high frequency variability related to the modern Julian oscillation or western wind blast, et cetera. So these events can have strong implications uh, for the timing of initiation and termination of the ENS event. So we have to include the, those the information of our system. So I know that developing the new scheme uh, based on SSD nudging, but uh, using the three river collections uh, collaborated with uh, Dr. Andrea Stroto, CMC in Bologna. Okay, so this is a two strategy. And actually we have another way for the improving the seasonal prediction. That's a strategy three to discovery of new potential source of seasonal predictability. I already explained the traditional approach for seasonal prediction uh, to predict the tropical climate variation and then to predict the their tail connection to the mid latitude. That's another possible way, a discovery of other potential source of predictability. For example, regional ASC couple phenomena in mid latitude because uh, mid latitude, uh, roughly speaking, mid latitude is an atmosphere drive ocean. But sometimes it's, uh, in mid latitude, we have a regional airship couple feedback. And also soil moisture overland and stratosphere, snow cover, sea ice, and ozone. Uh, okay, many other, we have other possible potential source of seasonal predictability. Yeah, here, here I would like to introduce the one example for the regional airship couple phenomena. So, because uh, I, recently published the two papers about that. So we found the new potential source of seasonal prediction for West Australia. Uh, this is named the Ningal Nino. So actually, after late 1990s, global warming and the negative phase of the interdecadal Pacific oscillations can, uh, as a warming uh, oceans of the west coast of Australia. So absolute SST values is warm ups, and uh, here is a, uh, Actually, it's a mid latitude, but it's kind of the tropics region, and a new climate phenomena was born. That's the Ningal Nino. This is a very similar to the Pacific El Nino, but this is a, of course, off the west coast of Australia, and uh, it uh, directly influenced on the rainfall over West Australia. So actually, uh, for Ningal Nino, so Kataoka et al. is a pioneering park for about that. Uh, he calculated the EOF first mode of the year-to-year -year SST vari uh, variability and defines the index for Ni Ningal Nino as an SST anomaly averaged in this region. And this is a time series of the Ningal Nino index, and uh, this is a one degree line. So from 1984 to, to the late 1990s, so no event uh, beyond the one degree. Uh, for the Ningal Nino index. But the recent 50 years, we have a four event uh, beyond the one degree line, right? So that means uh, in recent 50 years, we have experienced a frequent occurrence of Ningal Nino. Actually, our model is uh, nicely predicted this one because uh, due to the La Nina prediction scheme. And this is uh, published by my paper. And also, uh, this is important for the potential source of seasonal predictability of uh, Western Australia. I also calculated the simultaneous correlation between sea surface temperature and rainfall. Uh, this is a previous period, and this is a recent 50 years period. Uh, in the period one, no correlation between the sea surface, local sea surface temperature and the local rainfall. However, in recent 50 years, we have a high correlation between sea surface temperature and rainfall. So roughly speaking, we can say to the local SST can drive local rainfall in the recent 50 years. And also I uh, checked to the prediction scale for the rainfall. Uh, actually, this is a correlation coefficient between observation and prediction from September 1st. Uh, sorry, target is a uh, Australian winter. Uh, Australia summer, sorry. This is the rainy season in Australia. And uh, our model uh, have no scale 
to predict the rainfall, uh, seasonal rainfall uh, over the Western Australia in the period one. But uh, in recently, our model shows the enhancement of seasonal prediction scale uh, of rainfall over West Australia. So that's why the Ningal Nino can work as a new potential source of a seasonal prediction for rainfall over West Australia. So detail is published in uh, these papers. Okay, so this is a take home message. Our system is very skillful, but still it's not good predicting the timing of uh, initiation and termination of El Nino. So how should we improve the, this system? So model development and ocean initialization are equally important. And also the, another way to the discovery of a new potential source of seasonal predictability. Thank you.